Okay, in December, my wife and I decided to go on a holiday to Rajasthan. It cost 50 euros for my wife, as an Austrian passport holder, to get an Indian visa. But for me, as a UK passport holder, it cost me just over 100. Now, this financial discrepancy led me to ask my wife the question, why don't I become an Austrian? Why don't I take Austrian citizenship? My wife's response was one of those great pauses that comes before one of two moments in life. The first is when somebody stops to contemplate the brilliance of your genius. And the second is when somebody is taking a pause so that they can measure the exact scale of your stupidity <laughs> and inhale enough air that they can enter their lungs laughing at you. Sadly for me, the reply to that question was unrestrained, humiliating laughter. But finding out why I couldn't be an Austrian was the inspiration for my search for identity. Ich kann Deutsch sprechen. Ich bin mit einer österreichischen Frau verheiratet. Mein Schwiegervater kommt aus Bregenz in Österreich. Die, Bundes äh, die österreichische Bundesregierung hat unsere Hochzeit genehmigt. Also, warum kann ich kein Österreicher sein? Warum findet meine Frau diese Frage so lustig? It seemed that there was a myriad of barriers in my wife's mind about why I couldn't be an Austrian. I wasn't born there. My German wasn't Austrian enough. I'd never drunk a schnapps until I met my father-in-law. I was too English. And most damningly of all, I didn't understand what it meant to be Austrian. But couldn't I learn? Was the concept of my identity so fixed, so concrete, my sense of self so inextricably linked to the preconceived concept of Englishness, uh, whatever that might mean, that I could never be an Austrian? Couldn't I believe that I could become an Austrian? And my wife said, you might believe that you're an Austrian, but nobody else would. <laughs> <laughs> and that was when I got really interested, because in that one withering sentence was a dramatic paradigm shift. A movement from my own personal and intrinsic sense of who or what I am to the parameters for measuring my identity becoming externally weighed and measured, dictated by others' perceptions. Then I wondered, is that more important? Is the outward impression of my identity more significant than my own private notion of it? It certainly affects the way that we're treated and the way that we feel about ourselves. For instance, I've been teaching for nearly 11 years, and I can say that peer pressuring and bullying are still two of the biggest cancers on the education system. Both of these malignancies are built on extraneously established norms that students are either congratulated or victimized for their ability to adhere to or deviate from. And this begs the question, do we need acceptance in order to authenticate our identity? And where does a child's concept of their identity or an acceptable identity come from? Well, it's sold to them. Their notion of who they are and who they should be is influenced by their parents, by the media and marketing and advertising, through the jibes and mockery of older students, through their teachers and the education system, right through to the values that are transmitted to them in the children's books that they're brought up on. Everything outside everything working against them, telling them who they should and shouldn't be. When I thought about it properly, it occurred to me how dangerous that principle actually is. And I think that if there's a purpose to my talk today, then it's to say this. But I don't believe that we can be truly happy with who we are, and we cannot shape our sense of self unless we take control of our own identity. Unless we force down the boxes that other people and society want to neatly organize and categorize us into. I saw how, uh, equally I saw how the failures of other people to define their own identity had led to people in my family falling victim to racism and ethnic and religious hatred, all of which were microcosms of identity stereotypes that had been bred on national and even international levels. Now, I never would have met and married my wife if I hadn't have left Britain and moved abroad. My concept of my identity, or rather the external concept of my identity, wouldn't have allowed it. 
Now, my wife does have an Austrian passport, but she identifies herself as German. Now, when I was a child, I grew up with films like Indiana Jones, our hero here, um, who was a hero who fought and competed against the Nazis in a series of movies that was shot over 40 years after the end of the Second World War. I grew up watching Star Wars, where the agents of evil were directly based on factions of the Nazi party, the stormtroopers. And Darth Vader, the most evil man in the galaxy, was based on the outfits of the Gestapo and the German word for father. The cruelty and wickedness of the Germans was becoming embryonically absorbed into my consciousness. And if my identity was that of a good guy, a Luke, an Indiana, even a Chewbacca, <laughs> and what five-year-old doesn't want that identity, then the Germans were simply evil. Later, as a teenager and a football fan, I was exposed to the shocking casual xenophobia of the British press, who continued to link the successes, which were rare, and the failures, lots of those ones, of the English football team, to nationalistic wartime insults. I was led to believe that Germans had never disassociated themselves from the evil and the tyranny of the Nazis. And at best, I should despise Germans in Germany as my enemies. The national tabloids, comfortably the best-selling daily newspapers in the UK, openly referred to the Germans, and I quote, as Fritz, the Hun, Krauts, Germs, and Jerrys. Every single one of these words has its roots in the propagandist demonizing of Germans that took place during World War I trench warfare. And these xenophobic insults were so frequently used that they became normalized for me, became acceptable, as was the concept that we were still at war with Germany. I find it laughable that even as recently as 2010, a front page of a national daily, that's the front page, was emblazoned with a recasting of Churchill's we will fight them on the beaches speech. So what did that tell me as a child and a young man? It told me that if I wanted to define myself as English or define myself as an English football fan or even to see myself as a good or moral person, then I had to set myself up in opposition to Germany and its identity. And it was only through leaving Britain, tearing down the walls of that box, and reading another version of the only story that I'd ever been told about Germany, that things changed. But still, I had other preconceptions built into my mind about Germans. They were cold, ruthless, emotionless, humorless workaholics. And yet, when I received the news that I needed to be in theatre within 48 hours for spinal surgery on a broken neck, and having only spent three weeks with my then girlfriend since we'd first met, she looked me square in the eye and she said, you don't go back to England, you don't go back to Dubai, you stay here with me in Germany, I'm going to make you better. That was the moment that I knew I was going to marry my wife and it was the first time in my life that I knew what it truly meant to be loved by someone, by a German, who was the diametric opposite of everything that I'd ever been told or taught or led to believe about Germany and its identity. Thank God that my identity is fluid and not fixed. Shortly before I had that operation, I met my wife's parents for the first time, Wolfgang and Mira. I knew the few little details about them my wife had told me. Wolfgang was Austrian and Mira was Slovenian, Eastern European. Meeting Wolfgang, no problem. He was Austrian, Western European like me. But the prospect of meeting my mother-in-law filled me with dread and not just for the traditional reasons. Eastern European women fell into two categories based on my precise knowledge of exactly zero Eastern European women. <laughs> the first was based <laughs> on images projected through what I'd seen in papers and stories and in the media, fused together with bizarre and grotesque figures from childhood stories and fairy tales of taciturn, hard-faced, dark-featured old ladies who were contemptuous, scathingly critical, and broodingly intent. The second category was that they were underwear models. So I was stood at the door, having rung the doorbell, gripped with fear, images of doom and rejection and sorcery swamping my mind, muttering, 
please be an underwear model. Please be an underwear model. Under my breath. The door opened. My mother barged my Schwiegervater out of the way. She stretched her arms out as wide as they could reach, and she gave me the broadest smile that I'd ever seen and said, my dear boy, before giving me a hug that could have crushed a polar bear. What's interesting is that I don't know if I'd ever stopped to consciously think about Eastern Europeans at all in my entire life. So I'd intravenously absorbed all of these notions about the identity of half a continent's worth of people without even realizing it. What's perhaps more worrying than it is interesting is that my brain wanted me to do that without letting me know. Unconsciously assimilating information to construct identities that were palatable and concurrent with the stereotypes that appeared in my life in England. Now, there's a branch of psychology or biopsychology called epigenetics that argues that imagined or vicariously experienced events such as watching a TV show or hearing a story from a friend are not differentiated by our minds from real ones, triggering the same emotional and biological responses. Imagine the impact of that on our identities. If our brains are being incessantly filled on a day-to-day -day basis with horror-filled news and mindless reality TV shows, constructing us versions of reality and identity that are both disempowering and uninspiring. I want to use my family to show the repercussions of this form of external identity construction. Now, I've got a large section of family who are dual passport holding ethnic Jordanians. They're actually half British and half Palestinian. My cousin Deanna and her husband have lived in the UK for most of their married life, along with their four children. My cousin's a Muslim who sometimes wears the favoured uh, white or multicoloured hijab of uh, Jordanian women. She identifies herself as British, as a wife, as a mother, as a Jordanian, as a friend, as a daughter, as a teacher. She also identifies herself as Islamic. Her clothing makes her faith visible, and it's also made her a target thanks to the false mask of identity that's been placed upon the face of Islam, forced upon it by the external influences that every day are telling us what is right and what is wrong, what is normal and abnormal, what is perverse and what is other. In the wake of the London bombings, and again after the murder of Lee Rigby, my cousin was physically attacked while she was out shopping with her four children because she had had an identity allocated to her. My cousin is a terrorist because my cousin is a Muslim. More accurately, my cousin is not a terrorist, but a persecuted victim because normal British civilians had lost control of their own identities being forced into a primitive us-and-them mentality, having their identities unconsciously moulded like clay to fit into the accepted norms of someone else's reality or political agenda. My cousin was also verbally abused while she was out shopping with her children after sections of the media portrayed an isolated act of psychopathic hatred as endemic of the entire Muslim community. My British passport-holding cousin, who has a British mother, four British passport-holding children, and who had been to school in Britain, was told to get out of Britain. It was a verbal attack that was so disgusting that I can't actually repeat what was said here. Once again, what we see are the dire consequences of superseding control are shaping our identity. And we realize that unless we make ourselves aware, then we are not the authority when it comes to shaping our identity. Take a second to think about all of the people or factions that want to put us into that box. And we see the challenges that face us in mastering our own identities. Our family places its values on us. I was eight years old at a Margaret, anti Margaret Thatcher, anti poll tax march, yelling, Maggie, 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 out, out, out. I had no idea what it meant, but my mum had told me that it was bad. And I just thought it was great to be able to yell offensive language and not get whacked on the backside with a wooden spoon. We've seen that our religion shapes our identity. Our society does it, socially constraining us and pushing us to accept its values and its norms. Our context, even our own bodies, are exerting pressure on our identities. 
Every short man who's ever wished to be taller, every ginger-haired person who's ever wished to be blonde, every flat-chested woman who's ever prayed for an augmented chest, often our fondest wish is to be something that we cannot be, but that we're told that we should be. And in fact, the existence of the cosmetics and the plastic surgery in industry is proof that people are so desperate for a form of identity that they are told to have, that they're willing to alter the previously immutable and absolute truths of their genetics and biology in order to concur with a societally agreed notion of beauty and appearance. So why can't I be in Austria? Is it because somebody else told me I can't be? Is it because the average European adult is exposed to over 2,000 marketing messages every day, telling them everything from what to think about the Crimean invasion to what they need to wear to be cool, and I'm incompatible with those messages? Is it because people define me by where I come from, my language, my looks, or my dress sense? Maybe it's because over decades, other people, including myself, have been socialized into a culture and nationality comprising their history, their psyche, and their lifestyle. Or maybe it's just a mixture of all of these things. But I'm going to be an Austrian. And I'm going to be my own version of an Austrian. No yodeling, no skiing, maybe a lederhosen. I might only be an Englishman who happens to have an Austrian passport, if that is what I want to be. Because what I've realized is that so much of the ugliest side of mankind begins with external paradigms of identity. And not only this, but pretty much all of the best things that have ever happened to me in my life have been at moments when I've been in control of my identity, shaping my path based on my desires, not the desires that I was told to have. Go out, experience the world yourself, challenge everything that you're told. It's your identity, nobody else's. Be yourself.